You can't fly a rocket without a way to get it back. This is how you build a piston-based ejection system. I found it to be a reliable way to eject my parachutes or any other payload that I'm carrying on my rocket. Though I'll be working with specific parts today, the general concepts behind this system remain the same and can be modified to work in most rockets. The 3D printed parts will also be available on Thingiverse. Start by screwing two nuts all the way down the threads on a U-bolt. Once that's done, you can thread the U-bolt through the lower bulkhead. Place the metal plate over the exposed U-bolt threads and secure it with the other two nuts. This lower bulkhead will eventually be secured into a body tube coupler that sits between two airframe sections. We're going to do this using some super strong two-part epoxy. We'll also use a different body coupler as the piston that will push the parachute and any other payload out of the top of your rocket. This body tube coupler experiences a bit of friction against the airframe. Once we've fired a few ejection charges, this will only get worse. We'll make this body tube coupler a little bit smaller. By cutting down the length of it and folding it slightly over itself, we'll end up decreasing its diameter by just enough so that it slides very freely through the airframe. This part will become the head of the piston. It slides freely through until you fold it over itself like mentioned before. Before we attach the piston head, we'll need to clamp down this body tube coupler with some super glue along this edge. And before we do that part, we need to get our webbing or shock cord ready. After unraveling it, we want to end up cutting about three or four body tube lengths of this webbing or shock cord. In this case, it's far better to cut off too much rather than too little. Before epoxying the piston head to the piston, we'll thread the shock cord or webbing through the center hole. If you're building your own system, this part doesn't have to be entirely airtight, but it should be pretty close. I'll use some medium CA here to clamp the piston down onto itself. In the same manner as cutting the shock cord, you want to use too much glue rather than too little on this. You don't want any of this stuff coming apart in the wrong way. With these parts in place, it's time to generously apply the CA glue. After applying it, you can hold it in place for a little bit until it sets and hardens, at which point you can remove the piston head. We're about to apply the epoxy, so it's a good idea to sand down the edges of all the parts that we'll be gluing. These parts are the lower bulkhead as well as the side of the piston head. Sanding these parts down helps the epoxy get a strong grip. Since our epoxy is two different parts, we'll have to squeeze it out first and then mix it together before we can apply it. Once it's ready, you can again apply a generous amount to the side of the lower bulkhead. Frankly, I put way too much on this, but I spread it around the whole thing to try to even it out. When the part is ready, slide it into the top of the airframe coupler, which will connect the two airframe segments. As mentioned before, I used too much epoxy and had to scrape some off before the bulkhead would fit in. Once the top of the bulkhead is flushed with the top of the body coupler, I scraped away the excess epoxy and set it down to dry. I then repeated a similar process with the piston head and the piston. This time, not only did I apply too much epoxy, but I also got it all over my hands. If you build this yourself, I recommend being more careful than I was, because getting epoxy on your hands is not that much fun. With the pieces now in place, you can wipe off any extra epoxy before setting them down to dry. The epoxy is now dried and hardened, and we can begin to put the rest of the rocket together. You can start by drawing straight reference lines from the top of each screw that secures the flight computer. Along these lines is where we'll place the drill holes that secure the body coupler to the lower half of the airframe. The body coupler is 6 inches in length and 3 from the halfway point. Divide that in two to get 1.5 inches, which is where we'll put the screw holes for the body coupler. It's a good idea to also mark this halfway point on the body coupler. This will help us assemble the rocket later on. I like to mark it in multiple places around the coupler, just to be clear. Sliding the coupler into the airframe to around the halfway point, we can now make our first drill hole. Once the hole has been drilled, we can place the first screw in to make sure the coupler does not rotate anymore. We'll repeat the process for the remaining three holes and screws. We need a way to mount the rocket to the launch rail. We'll do this by using small screws that fit the launch rail pretty well, but are a bit cheaper and stronger since they're made of metal. To help them mount securely, I cut up several small parts of older airframe and attach them to the current airframe using another generous portion of CA glue. I stacked these airframe segments on top of each other several times to further the effect and keep the rail away from the vehicle body. Once the glue had dried, I drilled the appropriate holes for the screws to tap into. 
The holes for these screws were significantly smaller than the screws themselves. I used a drill to help force them in, at which point they became fairly secure. After mounting the rail buttons, I followed the same basic steps as before for creating the drill holes on the body tube coupler, but this time on the upper airframe segment. We're going to be painting this rocket soon, but we first need to remove the flight computer. The vectoring mount can stay in the rocket, it performs just fine with paint and it looks cooler that way too, but the flight computer cannot and does not do well with paint on it. The only change to make on the vectoring mount is to tape up the exposed leads so they don't get paint on them. Before we get painting, we're going to finish up the parachute assembly. Our nose cone is a little bit loose, so we'll take some blue tape and apply it around the edge. We want enough friction so that it comes off fairly easily, but not if you were to just tip it upside down. Next, we'll be attaching what look like little chain links to the end of the webbing or shock cord. There are several knots you can use to do this, but my favorite is called a Duncan or a Uni knot. To start this knot, we'll thread a good deal of the webbing or shock cord through the link here. We'll then fold it back on and over itself to form a loop. Once the loop is made, thread the end of the shock cord through itself in that loop. Wrap it around these two parts of the cord several times, ideally at least three or four. Once complete, pull the very end of the shock cord while holding the link. You can then pull either part of the shock cord to tighten the knot. I like to make sure it's very, very tight, but you don't have to get too crazy with it. These knots are quite strong and should hold the test of time well. I've used them on several rockets and have yet to have them fail me. The next step is to do the same on the opposite end of the shock cord. We'll tie the same basic knot here, again attached to this little link. At this point, you should have a link on either end of your piston. Connect the link at the bottom of the piston to the U-bolt on the lower bulkhead. Make sure to lock those threads down tight. There should be no way for the shock cord and the bottom half of your airframe to disconnect. Grab the other link and thread it through the upper half of your airframe, along with the piston. Because we made it much smaller, it should slide very freely through there. You can also take this opportunity to connect the two airframe halves. Now we'll attach the top half of the shock cord or webbing to the nose cone. Before you tighten down that link, there's one other thing that we have to attach, and that's the parachute. Just for this video, I'm using a small red nylon parachute, but for the actual launch, I'll be using a much larger one that is better suited for this rocket. Take the strings from your parachute and thread them through the link. Tighten the link down, make sure it's nice and secure just like the bottom, and you're all set. Now you can slide the nose cone onto the top of the rocket, and it's time to paint! I decided to paint my rocket a matte gray. I really like flat colors, and this fit the bill just perfectly. There's not a whole lot of voiceover that's really necessary here. I painted the top part of the rocket. Then I waited for a few minutes while that part dried at which point I painted the bottom part of the rocket. This part of the build isn't really rocket science, short and even strokes will do just fine. The paint is now dry and it's time to do a live test of the parachute ejection system. The first step to doing that is disassembling the rocket and loading one of the pyros into the lower bulkhead. I won't go over how to build these here, but I'll link a document in the description that explains it pretty well. Once the pyro charge is lodged in the lower bulkhead, we need to attach it to the flight computer. I like to do this using two wires with alligator clips on the end. In the long run, it's much easier than attaching and detaching lots of pyro charges just directly to the flight computer. For this static test, we need to connect to pyro channel 4, which activates for a brief period at the end of the static fire countdown. We'll screw those alligator clips into the terminal block and feed them up through the top bracket of the flight computer. Then we'll connect the pyro charge to the alligator clips. Don't worry, this is safe anytime the computer is off or not in the static fire test mode. The pyro channels always favor being closed when the computer is on or off. It's important to wrap tape around both of these leads. We don't want them touching each other, because if they do, they could short out the pyro and it wouldn't fire. Once again, we'll thread the TVC extension cables up through the bottom of the flight computer and connect them to their respective ports. Also, like before, we'll remove all the slack from the TVC line as we slide the flight computer into the body tube. We'll secure the computer with two 3.5mm screws and do the same for the body coupler. The last step is to also do the same with the top half of the airframe. It's time to configure the rocket for an ejection test. Remove the micro SD card and open up the configuration file on your computer. With the file open, we first need to turn off TVC hardware alignment by switching that 1 to a 0. Then we'll scroll down to the bottom of the settings and turn the static fire mode on by switching that 0 to a 1. 
You'll note that the timer here is set for 10 seconds, which is how long the vehicle will count down for until firing that pyro. Save the file, eject the micro SD card, and put it back into signal alpha. After the SD card is inserted, do not turn the rocket back on. We need to wait till we go outside to do this because it is now armed. To safely perform this test, I put the rocket on a launch rail, just like it would be for a regular launch. It slid down on the rail buttons and simply rested on the ground. At this point, once I had made sure the area was clear, I turned the rocket on to begin the static fire. I stood back as it counted down from 10 seconds. This classifies as an excellent static fire test. Both the chute and the nose cone deployed normally, the piston came out of the rocket just a little bit, and everything stayed intact. After the test, I brought the rocket back inside, and I took it apart again. Inside this part of the rocket, you can see that the pyro charge has left a good deal of soot in and around the whole area. This is normal for this type of ejection, so there's no need to worry. Since the pyro charge is spent, we can't use it anymore. I disconnected it from the alligator clips, and removed it from the lower bulkhead. Since we know our build works well, I'm going to go ahead and load two more pyro charges into the lower bulkhead. These are fresh charges and can be used in our first flights. That said, it's good practice to not wire up the pyros until you're ready to fly, so we'll keep them unwired for now. We'll screw the bottom of the airframe back on, as well as the top. <laughs> 